Well, if I could stand here for the next 10 minutes and get away with um, just laughing at Tony Abbott, I would. Um, but it also, it did force me to change my talk a little bit. So I wanted to address um, Malcolm Turnbull, the new leader. And when he announced his bid to become the leader um, on Monday, uh, he promised quite a new style of leadership. Uh, the problem is that, in my opinion, that's about all that we can hope for from the new Prime Minister. A change in style, but not a change in substance. Now, in his first day as the new Prime Minister, Turnbull categorically ruled out uh, any change to his predecessor's climate policies. That means a refusal to improve Australia's tiny emissions cut pledge at the UN climate talks in Paris later this year. It means Abbott's direct action scheme is here to stay. And that's despite a report earlier this month that showed that the scheme will force only 30 of Australia's top 150 polluters to, to cut any emissions at all. Of the 20 biggest polluters in Australia, all of them will be able to increase emissions under direct action. Uh, now, Turnbull's stance also means no change to federal government support for coal and coal seam gas extraction. And the Turnbull prime farmland will still be dug up for coal mines. Public health will still be sacrificed for toxic gas wells. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park will still be dredged to make way for coal exports. And we'll see, see what happens, but there's also a proposal um, to change the law uh, to rule out any ability for uh, environmentalists to challenge uh, mining development as well, the green lawfare thing. Um, so at, the, at, at this point, um, Turnbull has not committed to changing any of those things. Nor will there likely be any substantial change to the monstrous $41 billion in public subsidies that the IMF reported uh, last month that Australia's fossil fuel industry will receive this year. $41 billion. Now when I, when I read that, that news story about the report, I almost sort of threw my laptop at the window. It's, it's maddening to think that's the, the, some of the, you know, the, one of the wealthiest industries in, on the planet gets so much from the public. It's bad, maddening to me because it would be cheaper for the federal government to fully fund Beyond Zero Emissions plan to convert all our energy to 100% renewables. That's costed at $37 billion a year. It would be cheaper. What's the defence budget? I don't know what the defence budget is. Um, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, no, if, no, anyone, if anyone, if anyone, if anyone, yeah, but it's yeah. another, it's Which another example. Because, yeah. you know, when everyone asks, where's the money going to come from for these bold plans to convert us to renewables? Well, the money is already there, but it's going to the, all the wrong places. So Turnbull won't stray far from Abbott's climate agenda, but he does intend to sell it far less crudely. So... I predict we say goodbye to the oafish claims that coal is good for humanity. Uh, goodbye to the revolting jokes about Pacific Island nations being swamped by rising seas. We can instead look forward to perhaps guarantees of gradual market-led change sometime far from the future. And, per and perhaps some cultivated murmurs of regret uh, that low-lying islands face such a troubled future. Now, whatever Turnbull's personal preferences might be, and I, I was just discussing with Vivian that, uh, that five years ago or so, we witnessed Turnbull speaking at the launch of Beyond Zero Emissions 100% plan. He gave a very good talk um, endorsing, endorsing the, launching the plan. Um, but whatever his, his personal preference might be, there's very little prospect of genuine climate action under his prime ministership not if he wants to stay the leader of a political party that is so wedded to powerful mining and fossil fuel industries. Now, former Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett, uh, an Abbott supporter, furiously denounced Turnbull on, on Monday, and he called him the Kevin Rudd of the Liberal Party. Now, environmental issues, I think it's more likely Turnbull will be remembered as the Liberal Party's answer to Peter Garrett, the former ALP Environment Minister. Yet another politician who abandons their prior commitments to green policies at precisely the moment when they've attained the political sway to advance them. 
And it's not just the Liberal Party that's fallen uh, victim to, I guess, institutional capture by the big polluters. The newly elected president of the National Party is a coal uh, company lobbyist. The newly installed chief of staff to Labor leader Bill Shorten is a coal company lobbyist. And former Labor Minister Martin Ferguson shows us that the, revo the revolving <coughs> door spins in both directions. He left politics to become an oil and gas company lobbyist. Though, I guess you could say Ferguson was an oil and gas company lobbyist well before he was actually paid to do it. Meanwhile, the alarming signs that climate change is hurtling us into a new and unstable future keep mounting. Last year uh, broke the record for the hottest year yet recorded. But so far this year, with the return of the El Nino effect, that cycle in, uh, which, which, which comes around every 10 years or so, return of the El Nino effect, the old records are not being broken, they're being knocked out of the park. So this year scientists have marked the hottest July on record, dating back to 1880, the records date back that far, and also the hottest period from July, sorry, from January to July on record. In a, paper, in a paper he released last month, former NASA climate scientist James Hansen said, quote, we can already predict that the 2015 global temperature will exceed the prior warmest year, 2014, by an unusually wide margin and exceed 1998, which was the last, um, or which was dubbed then the El Nino of the century, or the last century, will exceed that even further. End quote. Now other scientists who still work for NASA have warned that this time around what the, the global warming supercharged El Nino that we're just sort of at the start of, what they've dubbed the Godzilla El Nino, um, may will very likely lead to even higher temperatures in 2016. So they're already calling that the record will be broken this year and then another record will be broken again in the year to after that, <coughs> ocean scientists said this week that they predict coral reefs near Hawaii will suffer the worst ever bleaching this year. And that's because ocean temperatures are peaking up to three degrees Celsius above, above normal. <coughs> in California, uh, in, in the States, which is still gripped by a record breaking drought entering its third year, um, the ice pack in the Sierra Nevada, the mountain, the ice pack which most of the state relies upon for its, its water sources, is at its lowest extent for the past 500 years. The Arctic ice cap reached its yearly minimum yesterday. Um, it was the fourth smallest extent reco uh, recorded, so the extent how much, how much of the ice cap is in its total area. Uh, it was the fourth smallest recorded, but the nine smallest ice caps um, have been recorded in the past nine years. So what do we do? What can we do when we are witnessing the life support systems of the earth being destroyed? When that destruction is accelerating and when those who hold political and economic power see their first priority as keeping things pretty much as they are. Look, at her recent talk at the Sydney Opera House, Naomi Klein did offer some good ideas. Um, we're going to publish her talk soon, um, but it's already up on, if you didn't get to see it, you can, there's a YouTube of it as well, which I recommend. Um, foremost among them was her plea for people to take action themselves. We can't aff afford to leave our fate in the hands of, of deceitful politicians. We can't rely on the invisible hand of the market or hold out hope that a, for a, a technological silver bullet which could solve these things for us. So in her book, This Changes Everything, she calls for building what she called, a termed a movement of movements around climate change. A movement that can bring together all those who will be worst affected by climate chaos. Uh, farmers, indigenous groups, trade unionists, environmentalists, religious faiths and others. And in the, the rallies which will take place around, um, on November 29 or around the globe, uh, they have been um, uh, called for, the, the call for that came originally from uh, a coalition but really led by, by 350.org, the, the group that Naomi Klein is, is a part of. Uh, but Klein's most important contribution to the climate debate so far has been about what 
this movement of movements should aim to do. Her conclusion that climate change me means we must change everything draws attention to the fact that our present system is not just wrecking nature. Rather, as Klein said in her, in her talk the other week, uh, this economic system is failing the vast majority of people on this planet with or without climate change. Recognising the connections and how the system, uh, which thrives only on the never-ending accumulation of greater and greater profits, um, can only thrive in that, in that way. Um, and how it despoils both people and planet is very crucial. If we hope to bring people together in this movement of movements, together to campaign and what they can understand are, are their shared interests. It also means we have to start to expand our definition of what a climate issue is. Just one example, the inhumane way in which our country, our government, treats refugees, I think can also be understood as a kind of ghastly dress rehearsal for an unstable and a dangerous future. Um, conditioning us to refuse help to the future victims of rising sea levels and extreme weather events, to blame the victims for their own, uh, uh, for the situation they find themselves in. Now, in her talk, Klein said this, there is a bright line connecting the degradation in the way we treat human beings, whether they are refugees from Syria trying desperately to reach Greece, or whether they're Greek citizens suffering under unending attacks on their, to their standard of living, bloodless, bloodlessly called austerity, and the degradation of the planetary systems on which all life depends. The same forces, the same logic, are behind all of these attacks on life. She continues, um, that is what our current system is doing, and that's why I make the argument that climate change is not just about carbon pollution. It's the collision between carbon pollution and a toxic ideology of market fundamentalism that has made it impossible for our shackled leaders to respond while, our simu while they simultaneously make the problem so much worse. So taking on what Klein calls this toxic ideology, which I would, I would um, well, remember my Marxism, I would add that that ideology itself derives from and, and serves to justify the toxic social system uh, we live under, um, but taking this on must be an essential part of our climate campaigning uh, going forward. Of course, here at Australia, we'll put us sharply at odds with, with Malcolm Turnbull, um, who I think is, you know, well, another, another Tony Abbott, but with better manners. I'll leave it there. Thank you.